Welcome! You're about to learn the inside details about Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. We're here today with Ms. Dina Kotlewski, MA, LCPC. Dina, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. So let's start with the basics. What is it exactly that you do? What's your day-to-day? Well, I work for Montgomery County Public Schools as a school counselor. I also have a private practice in Chevy Chase, Maryland, where I work with children, adolescents, and their families. And I work with them to help them solve, you know, common developmental issues and day-to-day problems. Great. And how long have you been working in this business? Um, I've been working as a therapist since I earned my master's in 1995, and then I became licensed in 2001, and I opened the private practice in 2006. Great. And and why? Why did you become involved in this area? Um, I realized that there was an unfulfilled need for children and adolescents, that they really needed someone to talk to, and um, I enjoyed working with children, adolescents, and their parents. Great. Great. Are there any special career highlights that you're especially proud of? Um, I suppose becoming licensed after many years um, was a career highlight, and then um, becoming part of a leadership team for Montgomery County Elementary School counselors would be considered a highlight. Great. Great. Now, describe the services that are provided, you know, with regard to ADHD and therapy. Well, my focus is working with children and adolescents to improve their skills in navigating through life's challenges. I work with children who feel depressed and anxious and sad, and um, their families try to help them develop better family communication. And, um, you know, we do that with, you know, talking and developing new ways of uh, dealing with issues. And um, how can you be reached? I can be reached directly on my phone at 202-423-6778. And I also have a web page, www.therapistdena, T-H-E-R-A-P-I-S-T-D-E-E-N-A.com. And that provides a lot of information about my private practice as well as links to um, other mental health services. Great. Now, let's let's start with some of the basics behind this issue. What exactly is ADD, ADHD? What's what's the correct term? You know, what are the differences or the official definitions of this? There are actually three different types of ADHD, each with different symptoms. There's predominantly inattentive, predominantly hyperactive, impulsive, and the con- combined type. And um, to diagnose ADHD, an individual must display at least six symptoms from very specific lists from the DSM-4. And um, the symptoms have to have started before the age of seven to diagnose a child. So they also have to have clear impairment in at least two settings, such as home and school or school and work. Um, And there must be clear evidence of significantly clinical impairment in um, social, uh, academic, or occupational functioning. So there's very specific criteria that you need in order to diagnose a person with ADHD. And um, if one is going to fall within the predominantly inattentive type, they have to meet one, they have to meet six of these criteria. Uh, Fail to pay close attention to details or make careless mistakes in schoolwork or other activities, um, have difficulty sustaining attention to task or leisure activities. They may often seem not to listen when spoken to directly. They um, do not follow through on instructions and fail to finish schoolwork, chores, duties. Um, They have difficulty organizing tasks and activities. They avoid, dislike, or are reluctant to engage in tasks that require sustained mental effort. They lose things. Um, necessary for the tasks, they are easily distracted, and are forgetful in daily activities. So if a child has six of these characteristics, then they might be diagnosed with the inattentive type of uh, ADHD. If they are, if they fidget with their hands or their feet, they squirm in their seat, they leave their seat in situations with, 
in which they're supposed to remain seated. Um, they move excessively. They feel restless during situations in which behavior is inappropriate. They have difficulty engaging in leisure activities quietly. Um, they often seem like they're on the go or they're driven by a motor. They talk excessively. They blurt out at answers. They have difficulty awaiting their turn. Um, they interrupt or intrude on others, either um, in their space or verbally. If they have six of these um, characteristics, then they can be diagnosed for the hyperactive ADHD. Um, but most commonly, there's a combination of the ADHD, uh, the hyperactive, as well as the um, inattentive type. Okay. Now, how common is ADHD? It's actually quite common. Um, it affects a an estimated um, 2 million American children. So at least one child in every U.S. Cl classroom can be diagnosed with ADHD. Um, in general, boys... Um, outnumber girls with ADHD um, at a rate of about three to one, and um, girls most often have the inattentive type. Okay. Is ADHD associated at all with any other disorders? Yeah. In fact, um, ADHD is often mistaken or found occurring with other neurological, biological, and behavioral disorders. Um, Nearly half of all children with ADHD, especially boys, tend to have also oppositional defiant disorder, which is characterized by negative, hostile, and defiant behavior. They may also have conduct disorder, which is marked by aggression towards people and animals and destruction of property, deceitfulness, theft, and um, serious rule breaking. Um, those are often found to co-occur with an estimated estimated 40% of children with ADHD, and um, approximately one-fourth of children with ADHD, mostly younger children and boys, also experience anxiety and depression, and at least 25% of children with ADHD suffer some type of communication or learning disability. And um, additionally, they have found a correlation between Tourette's syndrome, which is a neurologically um, based disorder characterized by motor and vocal tics, and um, ADHD only, like if you were only an ADHD person, um, is actually quite a small percentage. So they, there are quite a few other things that ADHD and other disorders are combined with. Right. Now, what causes ADHD? Um, well, first of all, it's important to realize that ADHD is not caused by dysfunctional parenting, um, nor is it due to a lack of intelligence or discipline. Um, often people think that, you know, this child is stupid or, you know, they're uncontrollable, but in fact that's not the case. Um, there's strong evidence to support the conclusion that ADHD is a biologically based disorder. And um, recently the National Institute of Mental Health um, observed PET scans, and showed significantly lower metabolic activity in regions of the brain controlling attention and social judgment. And so therefore, that also lends to the idea that it's biologically based. Um, biological studies also suggest that children with ADHD have lower levels of the neurotransmitter dopamine in critical regions of the brain. So that also lends to the idea that it's biologically based. Um, there's other theories that suggest cigarette or alcohol and drug use during pregnancy or exposure to environmental toxins such as lead may be linked to the development of ADHD. Um, research also suggests that there's a strong genetic basis to ADHD. Um, the disorder tends to run in families. Uh, in addition, research has shown that certain forms of genes related to the dopamine neurotransmitter system are linked to increased likelihood of the disorder. So. There are biological bases, there are possible chemical bases, you know, whether it be nicotine or alcohol, there are environmental toxins that may link to ADHD, so um, there's quite a few possibilities as to what may lead to a child developing ADHD. 
Okay. Now let's talk about treatment. What are some of the ways that ADHD can be treated? Well, the most proven treatments are medication in combination with behavioral therapy and um, stimulants are the most widely used drugs for treating attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, the four most commonly used stimulants are Ritalin, Dexedrine, Adderall, and Silert. And these drugs increase the activity in parts of brains that are underactive, um, which often confuses people. Why would we be prescribing a stimulant when the person is already hyperactive, but when you think about a drug stimulating areas of the brain that are underactive, then it would make sense. Um, therefore, it improves attention and it reduces impulsiveness, hyperactivity, and aggressive behavior. Um, at times, antidepressants are per, uh, prescribed for um, people who have ADHD, and sometimes those help as well. And most recently, the FDA has approved a non-stimulant medication called Stratera, and um, that also has been proven to be very helpful. But um, every person reacts differently to treatment, so it's important to work closely and communicate openly with your physician so that you know you have uh, the best treatment as far as medically-based treatment. Um, it's also very important to remember the side effects of um, medications, which include weight loss, de decreased appetite, trouble sleeping, um, <clears throat> and in children sometimes a temporary slowness and growth. Um, but however, these reactions can be controlled by dosage adjustments. That's why it's always very important to talk with your physician frequently, and especially as a child um, grows and their weight changes and their need for the medication may change. So very important to communicate openly with them. Um, and medication has been proven effective in the short-term treatment of more than 76% of individuals with ADHD. So medication is definitely one avenue to work and to, to look at uh, treatment. And then as far as behavioral therapies, um, <clears throat> A behavioral therapy would be rewarding positive behavior change and communicating clear expectations to those people with ADHD. Um, those things are very important. I mean, the consistency where a behavioral therapy plan is delivered is very important. Um, it's extremely important for family members and teachers and employers to remain patient and understanding and consistent, but behavioral therapies in combination with medication or even without medication have been proven um, highly successful. So um, children with ADHD can additionally benefit from caregivers paying close attention to their progress and adapting classroom environments to accommodate to their needs and using um, positive reinforcers. Uh, <clears throat> and where appropriate, parents should talk with the school district to plan an individual educational program, which is also known as IEP. Great. Are there any other treatments outside of behavioral and medication? Um, there are a variety of treatment options offered. Um, so, but some of these treatments are not scientifically proven to work. Um, some of them include biofeedback, special diets, allergy treatment, um, vitamins, chiropractors, special colored glasses. I mean, wow. people have really tried everything. Um, but the most proven treatments through research are um, the behavior therapies as well as medication. Let's talk more about these other treatments. What are, what are some of these examples? Can you go into some detail on that? Well, even before accepting a diagnosis of ADD or ADHD, um, parents should rule out other conditions that may be be confused as ADHD. Um, at times, allergies or sensitivities to different kinds of food can affect behavior. Um, exposure to toxins has been shown to cause hyperactivity or attention deficit, so, so therefore you need to look at those kinds of things. Children that might be exposed to pesticides or gasoline or herbicides or um, many things. Um, mild to high uh, lead levels may 
cause the same symptoms as ADHD. Uh, fluoride actually is a toxic chemical that has been linked to the increased um, lead absorption, so therefore it it may create the same uh, the same behaviors as a child with ADHD. High mer- mercury levels has been shown to cause that same behavior. Um, Children that are exposed to carbon monoxide also show these same behaviors. Hearing and vision problems, that's actually a very um, important thing to rule out because if a child cannot see uh, the chalkboard, you know, they may start to fidget, they may get frustrated, they may start to act out in class. If they can't hear the material that's being um, given in class, I mean, of course, that's very frustrating as well. So that may also appear to be... Uh, the same symptoms as ADHD. Also, sometimes kids are just very excitable. That might just be their their, uh, type of personality. And just because they have a lot of energy does not mean that they are, you know, an ADHD child. So you still have to go through and make sure that they fit six of those criteria that I had listed earlier. Um, Sometimes gifted children display characteristics that are similar to ADHD when they're bored in school, and um, they may start to fidget, they may start to act um, act out, so they may seem like they might need, need less sleep. I mean, gifted children often show behaviors that are very similar to ADHD. Um, and at times, um, it, undisciplined children are sometimes labeled as ADHD because of their defined and acting out behavior. Children need a lot of structure and consistent rules to learn self-discipline, and when they don't have that structure uh, because of lack of parenting skills, the child may appear to be ADHD. Also, one of the main reasons why a child acts out or throws temper tantrums when they have a problem is because of their lack of understanding of a problem and their lack of ability to communicate how they feel. So sometimes the child just needs some education as to how to communicate their problem or their frustration appropriately. Once they have that ability to communicate, they are much less likely to act out and therefore somehow might seem less ADHD, so they might not really have ADHD. Um, Fetal alcohol syndrome also uh, displays characteristics that are very similar to ADHD. Sometimes learning style or learning disabilities cause inattention and acting out behavior. And uh, children with a diagnosis of ADHD are typically a different type of learners. They may be more tactile learners or audio learners. So um, you need to teach them in in a style that they can learn. And... um, there's a lot of things that you may want to rule out before actually diagnosing a child with ADHD. Even Tourette's sometimes, it's a rare condition, but it's disruptive and it involves uh, children who have repetitive tics and facial movements and grimacing, and um, that may present as ADHD, but in fact it might be a completely different disorder. So it really takes Um, a team to figure out whether or not a child has ADHD, being the physician, being a teacher, a school counselor, um, a private therapist, and, you know, all working together, collecting data, you will be able to figure out whether or not a child has ADHD. Right. Now, can you describe some of the concerns around medication with regard to dosage or side effects or things like that? Um... Well, within a child's brain, um, a child who may have been diagnosed with ADHD, there has never been research that has proven a chemical imbalance within uh, the brain. So the medication is given sort of as a hit and miss, like trial kind of. And um, so sometimes it um, corrects this chemical imbalance, but really there's been no chemical imbalance that really has been proven. And um, 
So parents should know that these psychostimulants that are prescribed for ADHD actually will help all people, whether or not you are diagnosed with ADHD. But um, there, there are risks with prescribing medication. Um, between the years of 1990 and 2000, over 569 children were hospitalized, and 38% um, of them were life-threatening hospitalizations. Of course, that is an extremely small percentage of the entire population of children that has been diagnosed with ADHD. I believe I said earlier um, 2 million children have been diagnosed with ADHD, so you imagine that this is a very small percentage of children actually having some kind of um, life-threatening issue based on the treatment from ADHD. Um, but it's still something that's important to recognize. And um, many parents don't, don't realize that they're, if their child takes Ritalin or any other psychostimulant um, past the age of 12, according to the 1999 military recruitment manual, the child may not join the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, the Coast Guard, or the National Guard until a doctor has signed a paper stating that the child has been off medication for four years. So not only are there possible negative effects to your body for taking these psychostimulants, but also there may be negative effects for your child's career. Um, also, if a child has used Ritalin or any other psychostimulant medication, the state or federal government um, cannot hire him or her if the job involves state secrets or national security because the child is classified as a uh, level two drug user. So there are issues that a parent may want to consider before you know, placing their child on medication. Talk about the school setting with parents and teachers. If there's a child that might potentially have ADHD, what's the process around how to deal with that? Okay, the first thing um, that generally happens with a child who might have ADHD would be generally that a teacher would recognize it. A child would be acting out in the classroom. They would be, if, if they were ADHD um, with the hyperactive uh, component, they would be fidgeting, they would have difficulty sitting in their seat, they would be, you know, flinging around pens, they might be yelling out, not raising their hand. I mean, um, often when you see a child like this, this the child really does stand out uh, in comparison with other students that don't have ADHD. And so the teacher would recognize that, and the teacher might call the parent and suggest further action. The teacher might also um, start a process called the EMT, which is uh, Educational Management Team Review. So it would be a number of specialists within the school setting that would observe the child and um, start collecting data about the child and, you know, see whether or not we could help the child within the school setting. That would be the first step. And have a meeting with the parent. And then the next step might be for the parent to bring all the data and information that's collected by the teachers to a physician. That would be the next step. So sometimes we do these things called the Connors Behavioral Scales, and that would help pinpoint when the child is acting out, when the child has difficulty um, remaining on task or sitting still. And the parent would take these behavioral skills to the physician, explain what the teachers have recognized, and then the physician and the parent would make a decision as to what to do next, whether they solely want it to be something that's dealt with in the school setting, such as like a behavioral plan, and then maybe some um, talk therapy with a licensed counselor or a licensed social worker, or um, possibly going on medication, depending on what the parent preferred, but there is a lot that can be done within the school setting that does not involve medication. Um, we often put a child on a behavior contract, and that encourages the child to take responsibility of their behavior. For example, a behavior contract might state, um, don't, uh, 
don't call out. And Mm -hmm. each time that a child, you know, calls out, maybe they wouldn't get a sticker on their behavior contract. But if they did a good job and they, you know, maybe lasted the entire math class without calling out, they would get a sticker. And then, say, five stickers in one day would earn them a successful day. And then if they had three successful days in a week, then the child would be able to go to, like, the treasure box or have additional fun computer time. And that would be a way that, you know, behavior therapy would be, played out in the school setting. And then that, in addition to, you know, therapy outside of the school setting would be a way to handle, you know, a child without using medication. And then some children don't respond to the behavior contracts or behavior therapy, and then medication is really warranted. And and it's often quite effective if you get to a point after many months of trying different types of, um, different you know, types of ways of handling the behavior that, uh, you know, medication may be something that you may want to try. Great. Now let's talk about, let's talk about some numbers. How many children or adults reportedly have ADHD? Um, Let's see. Uh, The number of preschool children being treated with medication for ADHD has tripled between the 1990 and 1995. Um, I think actually, in general, all of the numbers have, you know, tripled, quadrupled as far as children either taking medication and being diagnosed for ADHD. And that's because of the expanded criteria of symptoms for ADHD, along with the increased awareness of these symptoms. And, um, I think that is really why more children are being diagnosed with ADHD because there's there's uh, quite a bit of statistics that proves that over the past um, 15 years there has been an increase of uh, 311% of children ages 15 to 19 taking medication for ADHD. Um, the use of medication to treat children between the ages of 5 and 14 has increased approximately 170%. Um, Generally, though, white suburban elementary children were given medication to treat ADHD at more than twice the rate of African-American students. Um, Ritalin is also being manufactured at two and a half times the rate a decade ago. So I think not only the awareness of how to diagnose, but the expanded criteria and maybe even the, the attentiveness of teachers and parents um, to this disorder is what is making the increase in um, statistical data. And maybe also people really keeping track. Maybe, you know, two decades ago people were not keeping track of how often this uh, disorder was diagnosed and being treated. Are the children that are receiving the treatments, are they meeting all the criteria or are they just meeting some or how does that work? Well, really for a good diagnosis, they have to meet six of um, the criteria for the hyperactive or the inattentive type. And um, I would say maybe a very small percentage of children are being treated with, you know, medication or behavior therapy that are not diagnosed appropriately. And that that's really why it's very important to have a proper diagnosis with, you know, the help of the school officials as well as um, the physician as well as parents. I mean, it's really a team effort to diagnose um, ADHD uh, correctly. Yeah. So just to clarify, this is not a mental illness. Is it biological or? It's considered a, a developmental disorder. Okay. Now, some people have uh, confused ADHD with autism. Is it is it different from autism or other behavioral problems? Well, autism falls within the umbrella of developmental disorders, but it is a pervasive development disorder, and um, its prevalence is about 10 to 12 children per 10,000 children, and um, it's characterized by severely compromised ability to engage in um, social interaction, and it also has roots in both uh, structural structural uh, brain abnormalities and genetic there's a genetic link um, 
So it is a much more pervasive and really when you see it being played out in a child, you would say, you know, an autistic child who truly is autistic really does not resemble a child with ADHD. An ADHD child is usually, you know, much, much better at verbally, you know, expressing themselves and autistic child could be completely nonverbal. Um, they often do repetitive, repetitive, like rocking motions. And personally, I've never seen an ADHD child rocking, really. I mean, I see them move around quite frequently, but, you know, I don't see them repetitively doing any type of behavior as an autistic child okay. would do. Okay. Now, does ADHD have any correlation to intelligence level, or is there no connection? Um, as far as the research that I have read, there's no correlation between ADHD and intelligence. Um, often, children with ADHD are quite bright and, and quite intelligent, and if they can actually sit through an intelligence test, which is often quite lengthy and difficult to, to sit still for, um, you know, their intelligence would be quite high on a IQ test, but um, sometimes it's real difficult to get them tested appropriately when they don't have the ability to remain concentrated on tasks. Right. Now, a lot of people talk about how, you know, ADHD is here all of a sudden, and they're like, okay, and these kids weren't around when I was in school, so what is the history behind ADHD? Was it first discovered at a certain time, or, or what's the background? Well, apparently it was first discovered in 1902, and it was written up in a paper on development um, back um, in England, I believe. So um, so this British physician described hyperactivity, hyperactive behavior, um, but he described it as a deficit in moral control. So... That was probably the very first time that it was really discovered. But, um, you know, I think with school systems becoming um, more standardized and with um, things like the No Child Left Behind Act, you know, there is a, there's a lot of monitoring of children and whether or not they're being successful and actually learning and behaving appropriately. So I think, you know, there's a lot of monitoring. And now that there's so much monitoring, you're seeing children not, you know, fitting into the mold of, you know, the perfect child that sits quietly and learns. So I think it's just becoming more visible and um, also based on the criteria that, um, you know, it's, the criteria has been expanded, and then there's also the DSM-4. So you have, you know, strict criteria to really, you know, label a child and make a judgment, whereas, you know, back in the early 1900s, it was just something that was noticed. Right. Let's talk a little bit more about the, you mentioned uh, genetics and um, the, the possible connection between that. Is it, since it is developmental, is there a connection between the whole pregnancy stage? Does that affect development or, or what's the, the connection? Um, well, the etiology of ADHD still remains unclear, although multiple factors such as genetic susceptibility and um, biochemical dysfunction in the brain and environmental interactions have been proposed. So there are many different factors that may be causing ADHD. Um, there is extensive evidence that supports um, the genetic factor for ADHD with a greater risk of the disorder being found among family members. So there is a genetic link. And in addition, pregnancy and um, complications in infancy has been shown to influence um, ADHD. Low birth weight in children has been found to be uh, another contributing factor for um, ADHD as well as other learning disorders. Um, there is a preponderance of evidence that supports this genetic
genetic neuro, neurobiological connection. So um, parents, it's very important that, you know, if a parent recognizes that they may have some symptoms of ADHD, quite possibly their child will also have um, symptoms that are related to ADHD. And um, also, um, behavior management techniques have been found to be significantly relevant to the severity of the expression of um, ADHD. So therefore, you know, parents with better parenting skills are going to have a child that may not have as extreme ADHD behaviors. A a parent who is more structured and um, more calm when the child is acting out and, you know, out of control is they're going to have a child that is less expressive of the ADHD behaviors. But a parent who also has very similar ADHD behaviors isn't able to remain on task or is inconsistent with their parenting style, that child is going to be more more ADHD, if that makes any sense. Yeah. <laughs> So talk a little bit about uh, these contributors. Are there different types of contributors to ADHD? Can you go into detail on that? Yeah, I mean, most um, most importantly, I believe, would be the genetic contributors. And um, research evidence suggests that ADHD is a trait that is highly hereditary in nature. Um, authors of a uh, study found that 18% of biological parents of ADHD youths had ADHD compared to 6% of adoptive parents. So that means that there is a 12% biological connection. That's what they were finding. So, you know, biology is an extremely high contributor to a child having ADHD. And um, there have been other studies where they've reviewed molecular genetics and... um, they found that ADHD comprises several disorders having different genetic and non-genetic etiologies rather than a single unitary disorder. So if somebody has been diagnosed with ADHD genetically, that they may not only have ADHD, but they may have um, other things linked to that. But that, this is getting like very specific in uh, etiology. But... Um, they have also found out that the comorbidity of ADHD, meaning that if you have ADHD, you are likely to have, um, you know, a bipolar disorder or a conduct disorder or, you know, oppositional defined disorder. These are the disorders that I had mentioned earlier mm-hmm. that um, occur throughout the family. So maybe a person in your family might not have had ADHD, but maybe your parent has bipolar, well, then you have a higher, there's a higher incidence of your child maybe having bipolar in addition to ADHD. So that's why it's, it's really important to look back at the genetics of a family to see if there are links um, for ADHD. And, you know, not that it would it wouldn't mean anything. Like if, you, if your parent had ADHD, it would only provide you more information of making a better, clearer diagnosis. And once you have that better, clearer diagnosis, you will be able to treat the disorder better. So that, that's the only real reason to find out whether or not there is a genetic link. Um, there's also biological contributors um, that are associated with ADHD and... Um, they're uh, related to the direct effect on brain development and functioning. Um, there have been some studies on uh, brains with MRIs, and they've shown distinct physiological differences in brain regions between ADHD uh, um, children and control children. So, therefore, you know, if a child happened to have an MRI, you may recognize that there is... Um, a difference in the brain of an ADHD child versus a child that doesn't have ADHD. So therefore, there there's a biological difference within the brain makeup. And um, that's important to let parents know that because it's not something within a child's control. Your child's not, you know, 
fidgeting constantly in class or calling out constantly in class, you know, intentionally. And sometimes when parents believe that it's an intentional problem, um, they're very hard on their kids. But when they believe that it's something that's out of their control, then it changes the way the parent views the child. Um, in addition, very low birth weight children have been found to have increased prevalence of inattentive, um, in a, inattentive ADHD and the hyperactive ADHD. And um, so that's something else to recognize, that if there's a child that has been born, you know, two pounds or three pounds, you know, they may have a much higher prevalence of developing ADHD. Um, also, 22% of ADHD children had a maternal history of smoking during pregnancy as compared to 8% of the non-ADHD subjects. So, um, of course, we've heard this a million times, don't smoke when you're pregnant or um, don't drink when you're pregnant because mm -hmm. you may have um, negative effects on your child. Um, so, and there's also family contributors. Um, to ADHD, boys with ADHD are more likely to have mothers with the, a major depressive episode or a marked anxiety symptom um, in, within the past year, and fathers with a childhood history of ADHD. So, you know, that just also contributes to the idea that you do need to look at the genetic history of a family in order to make a good diagnosis. And... Um, you know, once again, they may have oppositional defiant disorder or conduct disorder, or they may have fathers that have had that. Um, all of these things are overlapping as far as the diagnosis. And um, also there have been found some possible um, neurodevelopmental factors, cognitive and neuro neurological contributors that may contribute to um, the development of ADHD. So, but at this point, there's no single profile of ADHD. Um, like you couldn't say, oh, you know, here's this the cognitive functioning of a child and therefore they're going to develop ADHD. I mean, they haven't found it to be that causal, but um, it's very important just to be looking at all of these different factors as far as diagnosing ADHD. Um, traumatic brain injury also may then develop into um, ADHD or, you know, another type of um, diagnosis like conduct disorder. But, you know, again, that's a traumatic brain injury. I mean, that's a very, very small percentage of, of children. Um, and there's... Um, psychosocial contributors that you need to look at as far, as far as diagnosing ADHD. Factors that are associated um, with ADHD include, for example, social conditions, family stability, marital discord, psychiatric disorder in parents, parenting style, uh, the quality of family interactions. All of these things actually are, are extraordinarily important. I mean, if you're having parents that have, uh, you know, extreme marital discord, you know, a child may be acting out in school consistently. They may be feeling nervous. They may be, um, you know, really crying out for attention because they're struggling with issues that are happening at home or um, parents that are more lenient or parents that are very strict. I mean, all of these things may have a child acting out in school and you know, a teacher might think, oh, this kid has ADHD, when in fact, well, you got to look at, you know, what's going on at home. The child's not just, <laughs> you know, living in a bubble in school. So these are all factors that are very important in making an appropriate diagnosis. So with regard to the developmental aspect of it, um, those contributors, is there a connection between, you know, the IQ or is it your socioeconomic status? What are, what are some of the uh, factors associated with that? Um, well, in research literature, positive outcomes for ADHD children are associated with higher IQs, um, fewer health problems, an internal locus of control, meaning that they feel like they're in control of their life. Um, physical health, high self-esteem, positive coping skills, 
achievement and um, social skills. So a child um, with a higher IQ and fewer health problems <laughs> and parents that are good parenting parents and children that are from a higher economic status where they're having all their needs met, then therefore they're feeling more calm and they're better able to cope with the symptoms of ADHD. It's much easier to cope with things, um, any kind of issue when you're around a calm environment with calm parents. <laughs> and, um, you know, the child is going to be more successful in that kind of a situation. So when you feel more cohesion, more support, more warmth, um, you're not concerned about finances, there's a relaxed environment, there's two parents in the family, um, that's a predictor of a more positive outcome for a child with ADHD. When you don't have all of those factors, which many children don't, um, you're going to have more issues related to ADHD. Yeah. Um, the whole right and wrong factor, do these children have trouble determining what's wrong and what's right? I think that the main issue here is when they're sitting down and they're calm and they're able to decide what's right and wrong, they are able to decide what's right and wrong. But um, when they're in an impulsive mood or they're not able to, um, it's not even an impulsive mood, but if they're just more impulsive or more agitated, they're, they're not going to be able to make a better decision. But if you can catch them at a moment that they're feeling calm and able to focus, then they're, they're going to be able to make a very good decision. But I have to explain also that when you find a person who is not diagnosed with ADHD and they're agitated or frustrated or irritated, they're not going to make as good a decision as they would if they were in a calm, relaxed environment. Right. So, you know, um, I don't know about being right and wrong. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you mentioned that, that there are the similarities, and um, which moves into the whole transitioning as you grow. Can this be outgrown? Are there differences between how it manifests itself in children versus adults? Um, well, ADHD, and ADHD, it's, it's not usually outgrown. It persists into adulthood. And um, as someone with ADHD develops from a child into a teenager and then consequently into an adult, the symptoms of ADHD may look different. Um, often the hyperactivity of childhood evolves into a more impulsive, maybe even, you know, conduct disordered child you know, into that adolescence, and um, executive functioning and, and self-regulation um, impairment takes the forefront as the individual copes with the complexity of life. So as things grow and as the child grows into an adulthood, the, you know, the difficulties and challenges that they're faced with become more and more, and so therefore... ADHD is going to change as the person changed, um, changes. The hyperactivity may appear as uncontrolled arousal or feeling overwhelmed and talking excessively, and impulsiveness may look like irritability, quick anger, inadequate censorship of rude and insulting thoughts, poor timing in interaction. So, I mean, if you think about the people that you know around you or people maybe that you have had interactions with, you may even think about people that you know of that are like this, that are quick to anger or that are, you know, somehow you may say, oh, these people are kind of tacky, but, you know, maybe they don't have the ability to regulate their impulsiveness. Um, their inattentive may be shown as um, tuning out or the inability to focus. Um, so that may sort of remain the same, the, inattent the inattentiveness, but um, other things change and develop as the person changes and develops. So do we know more about the disorder in adults than in children? Um, I would think that we know more information about ADHD in children because that's when the majority of people are diagnosed. 
and um, a lot of the research takes place. So I would say more information is known about children and ADHD. You mentioned earlier about the differences between males and females. Can you go into more uh, detail about that with how it manifests itself? Yeah, um, well, girls or females um, generally have ADHD without the hyperactivity. So um, they're sort of more inattentive or more spacey, and that occurs more often um, than in boys. And girls are not often diagnosed until the teenage years or later. Um, Instead, they may be seen as, like, talkative or tomboyish or um, particularly those that do not have hyperactivity. They might seem flighty because of their distractibility, and um, they might seem kind of flaky or impulsive. Um, And some girls may have impulsive control issues, like they'll get into fights with others. Um, They may be labeled as, like, difficult or emotional rather than having a condition rooted in the brain. And um, these girls that grow into women um, that that may have not been diagnosed with um, ADHD, they might find themselves facing um, the same challenges as men with ADHD, the social difficulties and the time management problems and the financial disorganization and the lack of feeling um, like they have control over their lives. But, however, because women are often expected to multitask and handle a variety of work, family, and community roles, um, women may have several additional problems that men with ADHD um, might not have. Um, For example, they might have sort of like this superwoman perfectionism kind of syndrome. Many women feel that they need to do things extremely well and to the point where they're completely stressed out and burned out, and um, women with ADHD may find that they cannot meet even their most modest self-expectations, and then their sense of self deteriorates. So they constantly are feeling like they need to produce something, and then they're not able to do it, so they constantly are feeling frustrated. And um, they may feel shame or embarrassment or guilt, um, you know, in our culture, there's expectations of women that, you know, they have to do all of these things. And when they can't, they may feel humiliated. Um, They may have difficulty getting children to school on time or providing a consistent structure for homework. And um, then somehow, you know, it's their fault. And then therefore they'll feel shame or embarrassment. They may feel depressed. Um, While males might act out their symptoms of ADHD, females often internalize their stress, so therefore it might lead to uh, symptoms of depression. Um, Women may feel more anxious. Uh, They want to appear really good or even twice as good as men and um, in order to be treated as equals. So this can lead to a great deal of stress for... um, women who are trying to keep it all together and they're not able to keep it all together and so therefore they'll feel more anxious um they also have you know these dual careers where women are responsible for um the home and the job outside the home and families and child care and housework (laughs) so um women who have difficulty with organizations and following through on all these different issues um this may you know cause quite a bit of stress for a woman. Um, also, single parenting, where marriages, you know, end in divorce, women are more likely to be the primary or sole parent. And um, so not only do they have the financial responsibility, the disciplinary responsibility, um, you know, all the responsibilities of the home and managing all that and the organization, you know, imagine having ADHD on top of that, I mean, could be extremely frustrating. And um, not only that, you know, women's hormones um, sometimes get in the way with, uh, you know, creating moodiness or tension or a sense of feeling out of control. Or even when they go into menopause, they might feel, you know, almost like a sense of craziness. And, um, you know, all of these things are exaggerated with women who have ADHD, you know, they have ADHD as a base, and then you have all of these other things on top of it. So, um, you know, I would strongly suggest that any woman who's feeling any, 
you know, issues on top of already being diagnosed with ADHD, I mean, I would strongly suggest, you know, talk therapy with, you know, a licensed social worker or a licensed counselor, you know, just to help regulate and calm yourself. Right. Now, there are some skeptics out there, we can't deny that, that question the existence of ADHD altogether. Some people may say it's just poor parenting. How do we, how do we respond to that? Um, well, first of all, you know, hopefully if people were listening, um, there's, you know, quite a bit of etiology behind um, the diagnosis of ADHD. So, you know, if you look at your family and the history of your family, and um, all the many symptoms, you know, I would say that it would be hard to create all of these symptoms just based on bad parenting. Of course, bad parenting would be a contributor to, you know, maybe exacerbating the um, effects of ADHD, but I certainly couldn't say, you know, a bad parent could create a child like this. (laughs) You know, it's just there's too many other factors. Let's talk about some of the science. Is there research that's taking place on the disorder right now, and, and who's doing it? Yeah, um, there there is an enormous amount of research that's constantly going on. Um, one good place that I like to look is um, the National Institutes of Mental Health, NIMH. Um, they often have numerous studies going on, and um, they also have good research practices. So um, I think that's a really good place to look for um, reliable information. But many, um, many universities, you know, UCLA, you know, these big research universities, they often have lots of research that's going on in a lot of different areas of ADHD. So I would encourage people to read up on the subject. There's lots that's going on. So would you say that there are a lot of updates in research that like might reveal a breakthrough here and there or is there an, yes. you know, anything going on in that area? Yes. I mean, there's so much going on constantly and even things that maybe that they thought were, you know, set in stone 10 years ago, they may have found new information that refutes what they had found out 10 years ago. Exactly. So it's always good to read all sorts of uh, research and information. Right. Now, uh, with regard to diagnosis, um, are, what tests are normally used? Um, well, the behavioral scales that I had uh, talked about a little bit earlier, the Connors behavioral scale, scales that are um, filled out by the teachers and the parents, um, collecting that kind of information and um, bringing that to a physician would be the best way as far as testing goes. I don't know of a specific test that they can use, like an IQ test that could give you any kind of definitive information. But you're, you're basically making an educated guess with um, information from the parents, information from the teachers, information from the physician, and combining all that information to have a proper diagnosis. Um, also, actually, when somebody is accurately diagnosed and, say, they're medicated, um, the medication usually is 100% effective or, you know, medication and the behavioral therapy. So when you have an accurate diagnosis, the treatment will be effective. Great. Now, how early in a child's life can it be diagnosed? Um, I would say generally around seven. I mean, a child is constantly being, um, you know, developing, but uh, the criteria that's used in the DSM-4 is um, the criteria needs to show up before age seven. So I kind of think that seven is a good marking place so you can see if all the criteria has been met before age seven. Great. Now, is it often misdiagnosed? And if it does happen, how is this resolved? Um, I don't know if it's often misdiagnosed, but um, you really do need to rule out the numerous other things that could be going on. You know, the environmental toxins, um, you know, maybe parenting skills or dietary concerns or allergies, Uh, you know, I would go through the litany of things um, that it could be 
before diagnosing somebody with a diagnosis of ADHD. Great. And um, is there a consensus amongst the peers, the psychiatrists, about, about how it is diagnosed? Um, well, I think there is a consensus as far as, you know, collecting all the information together and, you know, making your best educated assumption as to what is going on here. You know, ADHD, it, you know, when you really work with children on a daily basis, <laughs> as I do, um, you can really see the difference between a child with ADHD versus a child that isn't. So you already have that sort of educated assumption, and then you have not only your information, but teachers' information, parents' information, physician, you know, physician information. And if everyone is coming up with somewhat similar information, um, that's a good way to diagnose. And I would say we'd all be on a consensus at that point. So let's talk myth versus fact. Are there any common myths and misconceptions associated with ADHD that you really want to clear up and put out there? Um, I think probably the most common myth um, that I run across with many parents is that they believe that this is something within the child's control. And I think um, that really does a big disservice to the whole uh, process of raising your child because if you're viewing your child in control of these, you know, constant acting out behaviors, you're, you're probably going to have a pretty negative view of your child. But um, I think really that's important to recognize that this is, you know, a neurobiological issue and a developmental disorder. You know, you're, you don't want to blame your child for this. So that, I would say, would be the most common myth. Right. Now, some people talk about how these stimulant drugs that are used to treat it are similar to cocaine. What's the validity, if anything, with regard to that? Well, um, you know, these uh, medications, all of them that I mentioned earlier, except for Stratera, which is a non-stimulant medication, um, are stimulants. So, um, you know, they're stimulating areas of the brain that are a little more, you know, slow or inactive. So... I, you know, I don't know actually the chemical composition of um, cocaine or, or actually the chemical composition of, you know, these drugs, but I do know, you know, they'd all be considered stimulants, right. <laughs> but um, I don't, I can't imagine that cocaine would act the same way on the same neurotransmitters as prescribed medication, but, you know, I, I couldn't say 100%. Yeah. <laughs> So have you come across any studies or heard anyone say anything about a correlation between the disorder and then subsequent substance abuse or violence? Well, yeah, there is, I think there is a correlation between um, people maybe who have not been diagnosed appropriately. So you have, you know, a child who has a lot, a lot of difficulty all the way through schooling, more than likely with their peers, more than likely with their family, and they come across different, you know, drugs that might help them. So, um, you know, it could be cocaine, it could be speed, it could be maybe even ecstasy, which, you know, also has, you know, an amphetamine component, you know, that they find is waking up the areas of their brain that have been inactive. And a lot of people use a lot of different uh, recreational drugs to self-medicate, you know, when, um, you know, not only for people who have ADHD, but, you know, people who, you know, have other issues, you know, they turn to alcohol thinking that's going to solve their problem, and maybe it does temporarily. And, you know, in the same vein, maybe cocaine or some other kind of illicit drug would satiate, you know, somebody who has never been diagnosed with ADHD. Um you know, and, it, it, you know, it is a problem, I think, you know, people who have not been diagnosed appropriately or, you know, not diagnosed at all, they really turn to something that will help them. Right. Well, let's talk about ways of, of coping with the disorder and, and enhancing one's quality of life. Um, you know, as a, as a specialist in this area, what have you found to be the most difficult areas with regard to coping as a child or, or, or an adult or, or treating it? 
Well, I really think a very appropriate diagnosis is the first place to begin. Once you have a very clear diagnosis, meaning, you know, if your child has ADHD, you know, do they have depression? Do they have bipolar? Do they have, you know, some other issue that's also hampering, um, you know, the ADHD? But once you have a very clear diagnosis, um, whatever the treatment, you know, being medication or behavior therapy or, you know, changes in diet or whatever, you know, you have decided to use, I would say that that treatment should be done, you know, effectively and consistently for a while, you know, before deciding, oh, this treatment's not working. You know, often um, a parent will start their child on, you know, for example, Ritalin for, you know, one month or two months and say, yeah, oh, oh, that medication's not working. Well, you know, one or two months to change, you know, seven or eight prior years of behavior, you know, trying a treatment for one or two months is just it's not, you know, consistent and, you know, long enough. So I think you got to be patient. You have to be consistent. You have to really try. <laughs> yeah. You, do you come across any uh, bullying challenges with the ADHD children as opposed to those who aren't diagnosed, or do you find that there's no difference? Well, you know, I would say that bullying um, really roots itself in, you know, the feeling of low self-esteem. So whether a child is ADHD um, and maybe consequently has low self-esteem, yeah, they might be bullies. (laughs) But, um, you know, just as well, a child who doesn't have ADHD and has low self-esteem may be a bully as well. So I kind of think it's a toss-up, but either way, you know, you'd have to work on a child's self-esteem, self-worth to um, make them feel valued so that you avoid the whole bullying issue. Right. So what kind of um, specialists, like who are the key players? Um, if, you know, a patient or family wants to turn to someone, is it counselors or is it social workers? Who should they turn to? Well, um, first of all, huh, as far as a specialist, I mean, you could run across a counselor or a social worker or a psychiatrist or a psychologist, and they may have no clue about ADHD. But um, there are quite a few of us out there that do specialize in ADHD and work um, primarily with adolescents and children. So when you do, you know, when you're searching out a specialist, I would, you know, call them and I would say, you know, do you have a lot of um, expertise in this area? I mean, that's a fine question to ask any professional and someone who, you know, is versed in the topic, then we'll tell you. And if they're not, you know, hopefully they'll be ethical enough and say, you know, I really, I really don't know that topic, but I can refer you to somebody else. Right. So, um, you know, any, any specialist, whether it be a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a doctor or a counselor or a social worker, um, you know, any of those things would be a good place to begin right. and then, you know, build a team from there. Right. Now, do you have to disclose? I mean, if I'm in school and I'm, I'm a child with ADHD, do I have to let them know? Or if I'm working and I'm an adult, do I have to disclose, hey, I have this diagnosis, I'm taking this or I'm not taking? Is, is there an obligation? Well, um, within the school system, if you want uh, your child to receive accommodations, then, yeah, you would need to disclose that. You would need to actually have a written diagnosis from a physician um, stating, you know, my child has attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and, you know, therefore they may need certain accommodations such as, you know, extended time during exams because, you know, they're not able to maintain focus or frequent breaks if they have difficulty sitting still or... um, so in order to get those specific um, accommodations, also, um, if a child's taking medication, they have to disclose that they have um, a diagnosis in order for the um, nurse at school to provide medication. So there's a couple reasons to, you know, disclose it for a child. Um, but as far as an adult, I mean, I think that would be within your own judgment. You know, if you wanted to disclose it, you could disclose it. 
All right, so what, what are these special services that a child might be eligible for in that setting? Um, okay, well, there is something called an IEP, which is um, federally mandated. It's across the nation. It's called the Individualized Education Program. So if, in fact, your child has this um, at school, if you were in Maryland or if you were in Arizona or you were in California, you would still be entitled to all of the same benefits. But um, they're for kids with any special learning need, um, any kind of learning disability, including ADHD, that impacts learning and accessing the general education program. So um, if you have ADHD and that's impacting your learning, um, you are able to get special services. And actually, it's called special education where, you know, parents are often um, worried, like, oh, you know, my child now is, you know, in special education. Well, maybe back in the day, special education was considered, you know, that, that behavior, you know, class, you know, where you're separated from all of your other um, peers. But special education nowadays is, you get pulled out of your classroom maybe for half an hour to an hour um, to get specialized services, whether it be speech and language, whether it be basically in-school tutoring with a resource teacher. Um, all of those uh, accommodations are available to someone who has ADHD and where that ADHD impacts their learning. So um, sometimes it doesn't impact their learning. So if it's not impacting their learning and they're just diagnosed with a medical diagnosis, um, they would be qualified for a 504 plan. And that, too, is um, a a federally mandated program. So, you know, whether you be in any state, you'd still get the same accommodations. But um, a 504 plan would allow your child to have, um, like, for example, during testing, Sometimes you have to, you know, read a question and then bubble the answer in a separate sheet. Well, sometimes children with ADHD have difficulty, you know, reading in one area and then trying to match up and bubble in another area. And, um, you know, they're a little bit disorganized. And um, they would be able to have, you know, write in the test booklet. Like, that would be one of the accommodations. Or um, sometimes children who have ADHD have very very poor penmanship you know not only you know the disorganization not only is in their paperwork but it's disorganized on the paper so um they might have you know larger ruled paper you know as an accommodation and um and that's available that would be available through the 504 plan as well as iep but the main difference is during a 504 plan would be that they're that the adhd is not impacting learning but that they need certain accommodations to be most successful. So um, what are some of the suggested strategies that you have for children and parents in order to manage this disorder? Is there something you can do like before, during, or after school? Or what, what are your tips for the parents? Um, well, oh gosh, there's so many different strategies. But primarily, first of all, I would make sure that the parent is um, has dealt with whatever issue they may have themselves. So if they have ADHD or they need some parenting skills or parenting education, that they have themselves in order first so that you're providing a calm environment for your child. So when you're starting a child out, like, for example, for the beginning of the day, you want them to come from a nice, organized, calm home and, you know, where their book bag is in order, where their clothes are on right, where their hair is on straight, and they have a good meal. (laughs) And, you know, when they start out like that, they're going to be much better prepared for any um, issues that they're having internally. Um, And, you know, during school, hopefully the parent will have communicated with the teacher saying, you know, my child is disorganized or, Um, we need to write down their homework in an assignment book so that we make sure that, you know, the child's doing all the things that they're supposed to do or, you know, I would like, 
you know, daily email communication from the teacher, you know, to the parent or, you know, there's so many things that um, the parent and the teacher could do working together to make the child successful. Um, And in addition, you know, letting the child in on all of these plans, you know, um, if the child's on a behavior contract, you know, holding them to it, making them responsible for that. And then also um, some activities for a child after school would be, you know, karate that um, really focuses their energy, especially when they have a lot of energy. So, um, you know, that would be a great activity for a child to get out, you know, some of their excess energy. And if karate wasn't something that the child wanted to do, then I would suggest um, gymnastics or um any kind of activity that would focus their energy into something, um, you know, because sitting at a school desk for six hours a day is extraordinarily difficult for a child who's diagnosed with ADHD. So you want to, you know, make sure you give them the opportunity to get out that um, excess energy. Right. And what about when a parent is struggling with, with the discipline factor? What are, what are some tips for working through that? Well, um, there's actually a great book that I often suggest to parents called One, Two, Three Magic. And um, it's a very, you know, easy to follow discipline program. Basically gives the child, you know, one, two, three strikes and then he's out and then has to sit like in a timeout area. And um, really, you know, it's, it's just a matter of being extraordinarily consistent. And the more consistent that you are with a child or the more consistent that you are actually with anything, the more successful it's going to be. So um, I would really suggest, you know, consistency. And if the parent is having difficulty with consistency, you know, go to their school counselor and, you know, get some tips, you know, whatever school they're at or, um, you know, even go to their, you know, local community. You know, church churches often have parenting programs. I know um, within our community there's a lot of parenting programs um, through Montgomery County. So that would be my suggestion if you're if you're looking for um, help and assistance, you know, being a better parent. Right. Um, what about dealing with your environment within the family? Like sometimes it might be harder during the holidays or you might have some unsympathetic relatives or friends. Have you come across that? And what are your suggestions for dealing with that? Well, I think if, you're have, if you have a consistent discipline program set up in your home, take it with you wherever you go. If you're going, if you have a behavior contract, for example, at home, and, you know, there are certain expectations that your child needs to follow at home, Have your child follow those same or quite similar expectations, you know, if they're going to grandma and grandpa. And talk to grandma and grandpa beforehand and say, you know, we're doing this, you know, behavior program and this is what's working and, you know, we want you to support us with that. And, you know, I think if people are open and communicate their needs and communicate, um, you know, with each other as to, you know, best support the child, best support each other, then it's going to be a successful situation. But I think sometimes when you hide things or, um, you know, you're not up front with the people around you, it's really difficult to support, you know, somebody who you don't know what's going on. You don't know why the child's acting like this. You don't know why the parent is, you know, disciplining in that way. You know, it's hard to support a person when you don't know what's going on. So communication is key. Right. Let's talk about the the adults. Um, what would you suggest for you know parents or you know a, a couple where you're married to someone who might have ADHD or an expectant mother? Um, how can the adults uh, deal with their with their diagnosis? Well, I think if you're an adult with ADHD, well, first of all, you've probably developed a number of coping skills that do work by the time you're an adult, or if if they're not working, you're, you're probably. <laughs> you know, really struggling. But um, if they're not working, if whatever coping skill you've developed has not worked, I would definitely go see a counselor, like, right away and try and work with somebody to support you and help you and and maybe change some of the patterns that aren't working well for you. Um, You know, if you're married to somebody that, um, 
you know, you're having difficulty communicating with or who's disorganized or, um, you know, isn't contributing to the relationship. I mean, that too, I would suggest, you know, going to a therapist and trying to work through those issues. I mean, I really think communication is the key and, you know, working together as a unit, um, you know, to create something that's successful. Right. Does ADHD affect pregnancy at all, or should an expectant mother pay close attention? Well, of course they shouldn't smoke, but is there anything else that they should pay careful attention to during their... I mean, if you have ADHD and and you're on certain types of medications, I would absolutely, you know, consult with your doctor and, and talk about, you know, this is what's going on and these are the medications that I'm on and will this affect my pregnancy and, you know, all of those things. Um... I mean, ADHD, it's, it, you know, it may create an environment where you're disorganized. I mean, also you have the, the hormones, you know, going crazy when you are pregnant. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, all of those factors may, you know, just make your pregnancy a little bit more uncomfortable. But I don't, I don't really know of any other, um, you know, correlation between ADHD and pregnancy. Mm-hmm. Have you come across any exercise or nutrition um, suggestions with regard to them alleviating symptoms? Well, I have heard, um, I don't have any specific experience with this, but I have heard that if you cut out um, white flour and sugars um, from your your child's diet, that may help, um, you know, if there's kind of a more protein and complex carbohydrate diet, um, that may help alleviate some of the symptoms of ADHD. I know some people have tried that in addition to behavioral therapy. Um, so, you know, dietary changes might work. I mean, I would, I would say try it. You have nothing yeah. to lose. It seems like exercise alleviates everything, so. Yeah, yeah, exercise would make you feel good. What about um, sleeping? Are, are sleeping patterns affected, and are there any tips for restoring that into a regular normal pattern? Well, sometimes people with ADHD need less sleep. They just, um, you know, they're, they're active and they need less sleep. Also, um, children that are on some of these medications may need less sleep, um, you know, based on a, uh, you know, an effect from the medication. So, but if, you know, if you're a person that can sustain themselves on five hours of sleep and, and you're doing a good job at work or you're doing a good job at school, you know, then I would say that non-effective, you know, not affecting you, but, um, you know, if you're exhausted every day, then, you know, I would talk with a doctor about that or maybe, you know, do some kind of meditation or, or, you know, yoga to relax yourself before going to bed. Yeah. Are there any um, tools out there, like electronics for um, children and adults that can help them stay more organized? Well, you know, we have tried so many different types of things within our school. Um, uh, you know, a lot of kids have a lot of difficulty with penmanship. They have difficulty controlling the pencil and then also making the words, um, you know, the handwriting clear. You know, we've offered children the option of using a computer versus, you know, writing their homework assignments. I mean, really, I think any classroom, um, you know, or school setting would probably do a lot to accommodate to a child in order to help the child be successful. I mean, that's how it is within my school setting. You know, I can't speak for everyone, but, um, you know, you really want the child to be as successful as possible in their learning environment. So anything that you can do to accommodate to that would help. I mean, I know that there's a little little computerized thing called an Alpha Smart that um, our special education teacher frequently uses with um, some of the ADHD kids and also some of the kids with learning disabilities. So, you know, there's probably a lot of tools out there that could help a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Now, finally, what is what is one or, or some of your greatest success stories in the, either the school or the therapy setting? Oh, greatest success. 
success stories. Okay, I have one really great success story. He just graduated yesterday. All right. Um, well, he graduated from fifth grade yesterday. <laughs> but when I met him, um, he was in kindergarten, and he had an extraordinary difficulty controlling his behavior and communicating. And um, I worked with him for six years, not only myself, but I also work with the speech pathologist. I also work with the special education teacher as well as the parent, um, as, all, as well as also his physician. We did try medication um, with him for a short period of time, but um, mom didn't want him to be on medication, so he oh. didn't stay on medication. But nonetheless, he's a success because in fifth grade, he is able to communicate when he is frustrated when he's upset when he needs a break I mean there were many many times where he would have just a total complete meltdown rather than just saying I just really need a break and now he can say I just need a break he walks out he gets a drink of water and he returns back to the classroom and continues learning so he's a great success great (laughs) Well, thank you, Dina. This has been very helpful. We really appreciate your joining us. Um, just in conclusion, we've been speaking with Dina Kutluski. Um, She works for Montgomery County Public Schools and has a private practice in Chevy Chase, Maryland, and working with children, adolescents, and their families. She is a licensed clinical professional counselor, and we've been speaking about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Dina, how can we get in touch with you? Um, well, you can call me directly at 202-423-6778. That's my office line. And I also have a web page, www.therapistdina.com. And um, there's a lot of information about my private practice as well as links to other additional information that um, parents may find helpful. So Great. Well, we want to thank everyone for listening. We hope that this information has been very helpful and that you've learned quite a great deal about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And Dina, thank you again so much for joining us. We're glad to have you. 